Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Melinda Barkhouse-Ross. As our very first episode together, I thought it would be a pretty great idea to tell you a little bit about myself, my love for sci-fi, fantasy, and tabletop role-playing games. My dad, for as long as I can remember, loved a great fantasy film, but, and it's a big but, it had to be a B-movie. You know, the ones that were so bad that they're kind of great. <laughs> the, the incredible stuff. Yeah, those movies. Anything with swords and dragons and archers and evil kings or good kings and evil princes or sheriffs. That's the stuff that I was brought up on. Uh, Star Trek, absolutely. Picard and Riker shaped my idea of what a man could be. Uh, the core group of Starfleet officers underscored loyalty and friendship with all of its glorious complications. Data and his search to be human helped put into perspective for me the absurdities of what it means to be human and underscored some of our best and worst traits. After all of this came the Ravenloft books. Yep, I read a lot of them. Uh, the Dragonlance books as well. Which, of course, gave way to Anne Rice, Ray Bradbury, and other classic gothic horror writers. All of this is leading us up to what we are going to talk about today, and that is Dungeons and Dragons. I know, I know, ugh, catching in on the popular, but no, not really. I first played when I was in grade eight, which was, you know, about three or four years ago. <laughs> Just kidding. It was a long time ago. Um, but I lost touch with those friends for many years. And then it was about a year and a half ago, I was brought back to D&D &D through another friend. It was shortly after we sat down and had a chat about it that I was creating a halfling rogue named Darjan and started out on an adventure with a DM and a few friends around a table. I was what I know now as a DM at the time, one of those troublemaker players, always bucking the rules and the clues to the obvious stories and talking to the table of friendly looking locals instead of going to the dark stranger in the dimly lit back corner of the tavern, which was obviously where we were supposed to go. <laughs> Basically, if there's a shiny thing, that's what Darjan was going to be drawn to. In a game with an open world that's a sandbox is what they call it, where you can play and do just about anything, that is really more than acceptable. But after about a year of working our way to Barovia to start hunting down the devil's strad, my DM pulled the plug with his intention to start a homebrew game, um, which is fantastic. And uh, as far as I know, things are going really, really great with that. So uh, really happy for him and uh, the players that uh, managed to stay on with him in his game. It just didn't work out um, for timing and stuff for me. Now, it was around this time when I decided Maybe I should try to sit behind the DM screen and start a game for friends and see what happened. <laughs> well, it was uh, last August. We sat down around my kitchen table. I'm positive that it was the hottest night of the summer. And we started with a homebrewed game that I found on DMsGuild.com. And we had a blast because of course we did. But this, I believe, is where I really caught the D&D &D bug. Having players excited about the content and story I presented was a really great experience. And presenting the puzzles in the game that stumped the players and finding interesting ways to help solve the problem, either through NPCs or leaving clues as they moved through the adventure, was really a good time. As a first-time DM, though, 
I want to talk to you about some of the things that I have discovered where I think you should start because that in itself feels like a monumental task. The parts of the game that I still struggle with and why I believe it's important to have players of all skill and experience levels around your table. And I also want to talk to you about why I think it is not important that your DM at your table be the most knowledgeable person there. I know. You think I'm asking for trouble already, but give me some time and let me make my case. Also want to touch a little bit on the Mercer effect and how it's impacted game expectations, both for first-time DMs and for first-time players that uh, may already have a big idea of how the game is going to go before they even roll their dice for the first time. I think Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition is itself the reason for the resurgence of the game. I know you're more likely to run into people who play the game than people who don't, but it could be that I'm just traveling through the right kinds of circles too with that one. Of course, its appearance on Stranger Things and the Big Bang Theory D&D has definitely, at this point we can say, officially been destigmatized as the game that caused all of the hysteria back in the 80s. I mean, out of all of that, we do now have the D4 dice, so I think we kind of came through it all right. <laughs> uh, with today's success in mainstream acceptance of things like Geek and Sundry, as well as, of course, Critical Role hosted by Matt Mercer, it's easy for people who have never played the game before to have more access to the game than ever. They get to see how it's played. They get to be exposed to character classes and races before they even sit down to play. This can bring with it a level of expectations for both first-time players and DMs alike, which may be unfair to put solely on the shoulders of Matt Mercer and his friends. It's more likely our fault as consumers of the entertainment and content they're putting out. No, you do not need to have all of the different voices to make your game more enjoyable. No, You don't need to have the eloquent and elegant descriptions of every single detail of your game. No, your players don't have to have a voice for their character, nor should they be expected to be masters of role playing with the ability to build on their backstories and reinforce their characters over and over again. Are battle maps necessary? Do we need to bring minis? The answer, in my opinion, is no. You can make the game as complicated on the tabletop as you want to. You can make it as simple as you want to. If you can't afford minis, we're coming into a great time with um, a lot of really cost-effective alternatives like the paper minis that are gaining in popularity. Uh, Never overlook the use of a D4 on a battle map. It's perfectly fine. Even dimes, nickels, quarters, if you're Canadian, loonies and toonies, all of these things can be used to keep track of your gameplay if you decide that using a battle map is important for your game. Those really great vinyl pads are amazing and very useful. You write on them with dry erase markers and all of that stuff. But don't turn your nose up at a roll of brown paper. You know, the ones that they use to wrap parcels in when they send them by mail. It's cost effective as well. You just have to do a little bit more prep work, like draw your one by one grid on it. But then when you're done, you're good to go. If you're able to use a service like Dwarven Forge to get all of your custom maps and 3D stuff printed, that's incredible. But Don't think or fall into the trap that tries to tell you that if you don't have a battle map, your game is lacking. I don't buy it. I don't believe it. All I think is what you need is a little bit of cooperation between players and the DM, and that is going to go a long way if your battle maps are based in the theater of the mind. Truly, what you need to start these days isn't even a physical copy of the Player's Handbook, or PHB for short. Wizards of the Coast has a free PDF that you can use, along with character sheets that you can download. All you really need for the first time when you sit down is a set of dice in your character sheet and an eagerness to learn and give others the space they need to learn as well. In some cases, that might include your DM, which is very much the case for me. All DMs, keep this in mind... All DMs at some point 
for a first time DM. I can't even imagine that everyone who's ever sat behind the Dungeon Master screen knew the answers to all of the questions, how to handle every single situation. I believe that there are many more DMs who bluff their way through situations than there are DMs who will eagerly admit it. There are zero things wrong with this as far as I'm concerned. If a DM is held to such a high standard, then so should the players. Both sets of expectations are unfair. It leaves little room for growth and learning and development of your game, which really takes the fun out of it for me. If I can't surprise a DM who has played as a DM for 30 years, then I doubt that DM is having fun anymore. If a DM can't drop something into a game that's going to make the players holler in surprise or have that jaw-dropping moment during gameplay, you're going to have to try harder as a DM. To me, that's the good stuff. That's where those memories are. Next on the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network, we are going to get into what you should do as a first-time DM and how to handle the learning process at your table with your players. It's not as hard as you think it's going to be, and I'll explain why after the break. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. SMC Sci-Fi Podcast. I'm your host, Melinda Barkhouse Ross. And just before the break, we were talking about how not every table will fit every player and how not every player is meant for every table. Variations in play style and expectations can cause a lot of agitation at tables. It's not a necessary thing. You should also be able to, as a player, walk away from a DM and a table without any hard feelings attached to it. Uh, players will get the vibe of a table very quickly, and if it's not for them, they'll let you know. It may even take a couple of sessions for them to figure it out, and you know what? No harm, no foul. Be the bigger person, and uh, even help them try to find a DM who is uh, more in the uh, game style that they're looking for. So when I sit down to play with my table... I do it with this incredibly obvious piece of information. I come to the game prepared for the adventure we are running. I have storylines. I have a bit of plot points that we need to hit. I have some conversations with some NPCs that I want to have happen. But what I don't have is an encyclopedia of all of the rules in my head. Um, I don't have all of the correct roles. I don't have all of the spells and the way that all of the different spells work for every single situation that could possibly ever come up when I sit down at my table. My players are very much aware of this. And as a new DM, they are open to helping me along the way. Um, As long as the conversation around a disputed rule or a role is constructive, I absolutely encourage it. It isn't solely my table just because we happen to be at my house when we play. We're telling the story together and I encourage the players to have conversations Um, about all of these things among themselves as well. I had an interesting philosophical and moral debate over killing a were-rat when we were sitting down at the table one time. Uh, They were were at a masquerade or something, and uh, there was some very strange experimentation going on, and the... You know, the question was, would the were, were rat change back or was it a polymorph that was a more permanent situation? I still think it was one of the more interesting conversations that happened around the table uh, between players and between their characters. As a DM, I am fully aware that it is perfectly acceptable for my call at the table to be the final say. And sometimes it is. And sometimes I'm wrong. And I have NPCs who have to deal with the fallout for that 
if I have made a mistake as a DM, I never have the players suffer for it, especially if it's one that we've had discussion about and I was unwilling to waver in my decision at the table. I never let the fallout touch the characters if I am wrong. My NPCs are there to deal with that. I think that's fair. Why would I be so adamant that I was right just to have my players suffer? It's just not fair, I don't think. This is why I value so much having different um, experience levels around my table. I have new players who rolled their dice for the very first time at my table, which I love. I have players who have been playing since AD&D. Maybe it's because I'm so new as a DM or because I'm still very much a novice player when I sit down to play that I have no issues with this at my table. Rule lawyering, however, is a totally different thing. And rule lawyers, you can only push your glasses so far up your nose before you lose sight of the fact that this is a game where you are going to fight dragons or goblins or ogres. Yes, please do bring up attack of opportunity if I miss it in combat. Have conversations about perception versus investigation checks and what constitutes the difference. Athletics versus strength. If the two roles are imp- uh, appropriate together, sometimes that could be the answer. But rule lawyering and refusing to move on because you don't agree with the call is not conducive to the game and nobody is going to be having fun at that point. Now, I have a sorcerer at my table who decides, let's say she wants to climb a tree to get a better look at the terrain. Well, there's a couple of things that I'm going to do with that as a DM behind the screen that might be unconventional, unconventional, unconventional if a player just wants to climb a tree. She's a sorcerer, so strength and magic users don't necessarily go hand in hand, but To me, she is going to need strength to pull herself up onto the first couple of branches of the tree, right? She's also going to need athletics because she's going to have to get from branch to branch to branch. I think those two checks as she's climbing the tree are fair. Um, The DC of the tree is going to be different if the branches are close together and easier to climb or if they're further apart and she's going to have to, uh, you know, do some jumping around through the tree in order to get up the tree. Um, As long as you are consistent, I think, is what is important. One of my favorites is you can try or you can roll for it. I don't think I have met a a DM who doesn't enjoy and relish being able to make those kind of statements as they're playing a game. So DC scores. In many situations, I have an idea if a task is simple, easy, challenging, hard, or very hard. And each of those gives me a number range in my head. And the DC number doesn't need to be known by the players as long as it's consistently used in a fair way. I think you're going to be perfectly fine. A couple of resources that I've used um, are a couple of guys that I enjoy watching on YouTube, the Dungeon Dudes. They're great. Uh, the Lazy Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, don't let it the title fool you. The Lazy DM isn't for DMs who are lazy. What the authors managed to do, though, is take the role of a DM and simplify it in a way that allows you to focus on the big aspects of the game and not get bogged down by bits of information that may not get used at all during your game anyway. So over-prepare, sure, but do it in the parts of the session that make sense. For example, if the session that you're playing up for this week um, has a lot of political intrigue in it, then over-prepare those conversations and the information that needs to be delivered to your players. Make sure you have a couple of NPCs who can deliver the information. Because if I learned anything from playing Darjin, it's this. You tell Darjin that you need to talk to the head priest about such and such. The likelihood of her ever getting to the head priest is very small. So she's more likely to go and end up talking to the stable boy. So you need to find a way to have maybe the stable boy deliver a piece of information, however altered or embellished it may be, because maybe it was overheard instead of directly spoken to. I mean, why would the stable boy and the head priest be speaking, right? Now, this leads me to another note for DMs. I like to have a list of NPCs that I can generate on the spot. Now, the internet will give you 
countless tables to roll on. Seriously, just Google it. Um, but I like to create my own. So on the inside of my DM screen, I have a list of 20 male names, 20 female names, and 20 androgynous names. I have all of the races, the classes, and backgrounds, along with some weird traits that I can use to kind of flesh out the NPCs on the fly. I recently had to find an NPC. Uh, she ended up being a female noble elf who had decided to leave her family and become a bodyguard. The weird thing about her, though, was that she couldn't whistle. So that was part of her introduction to my players around the table. Now, because she was a noble elf, it made sense that she would know how to play dragon chess. And uh, she did let the PC win because it was what kept the PC talking. So what I enjoy about this is now... After that session, I was able to flesh that character out a little bit more. I have another character that the players are familiar enough with to be able to go back and um, she can raise red flags or deliver bits of information just in case I, as a DM, am not delivering um, the importance of a message to the players. It can be reinforced through the usage of some of the NPCs that I've created. I even have a couple of NPCs in the campaign that I'm running right now who absolutely were not supposed to be as important to the game as they are starting to be. Um, I've allowed them to grow out of the original role that I had them for. And it's been really interesting and rewarding to see the players around the table um, really come to enjoy interacting with these two NPCs in particular. Um, The great thing, I think, about being behind the screen, maybe a bit of a curse as well, is that the players don't know when you have had to lay down a bit of patchwork or change direction completely on the fly. This is another point that the lazy DM makes in the book. Um, You should be prepared for as many scenarios as possible, at least a sentence. If they do this, then this. If they do this, then this. If you focus too much on what you think is going to be the big event and the players go left instead of staying straight ahead, you're suddenly left scrambling and you're not going to be sure what your next move is. Now, Of course, there's always railroading. Railroading is a term used to explain pushing your characters towards a singular plot point. And I think when it's done properly, it can be useful and not at all stifling to the game experience at your table. It does take a little bit of finessing, but I do think that it can be done. Next on the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network, I want to talk to you about the elephant in the room and talk a bit about my experience as a female sitting down to play. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast. I'm your host, Melinda Barkhouse Ross. One of the things that I learned pretty quickly when I was getting back into Dungeons and Dragons and sitting down at tables with strangers for the first time to play was that I was having really great and positive experiences, especially when I had read so many horror stories from women who had gathered around tables to start to play and had just horrible experiences. Now, based on those stories, I may have simply lucked out and manage to find good people at good tables. I mean, the gatekeeper stereotype is out there. You'll hear stuff like, oh, you've only played 5th edition D&D, you're not really a DD and d player, or um, you've never known the struggles of getting through 4th edition D&D, you're not really a D&D player. Honestly, it's absolute rubbish. And 
you know, it's the same as when you um, are on vacation in a new town and the locals try to tell you that tourists can't go here because this is the thing for locals. It's a load of crap. And I think that if you sit down at a table, you sit down at a table as an equal. Don't sit down and apologize for your presence at the table. Don't sit down and expect confrontation. And don't sit down at the table and look for confrontation either. I think the ability to sit down with your dice, ask questions, being open to receiving answers, even if the answer answers that you get come across with a questionable tone, eventually you're going to have an opportunity to show what you're capable of as a player. Trust me. The stereotypical gatekeeper um, that can surround a lot of games when you sit down to play does affect the overall game. And I think that it affects the perception of the game too. If one person sits down and they have a bad experience, they're going to warn other people against sitting down and trying to play. And that's completely detrimental. Why would you want a thing that you love so much to be hidden from such a huge section of the population? It's so weird and counterproductive. You want people to come to this hobby that you love so much. Is it awful that it's so mainstream now? It doesn't need to be. Is it awful that new people are sitting down to play D&D for the very first time? No, that should be celebrated as a matter of fact. I think that this idea that someone has been playing a game for 35 years and is unwilling to welcome new players is frankly immature and very silly. I know again, and I recognize that I'm coming from a place where I'm very lucky to have not had or faced any of these gatekeepers or have really negative experiences around a table. But it's just goofball. You don't need to do that. Also, don't be afraid to find your own table. Mine currently just happens to be an all-female group. And instead of doing a book club and reading other people's stories, we thought that D&D would be a really cool way for us to sit down around the table, tell our own stories, and have a couple of glasses of wine, have some delicious food while we play, and really just enjoy the company of each other. That sounds like a wonderful thing, right? The opposite can also be true. If there's a group of dudes that want to sit down and play a game together and they don't want girls sitting at their table because that's their guy time, great. Leave them to it. Find a different table. Let them have their guy time. It's just like our table that uses ours for our girl time every week. Now, please... Please don't send me angry email because I don't want to sound like I'm trying to diminish the difficulties of what I know women have been faced with as they try to get into gaming. I know it because I have friends and I have other people who have tried to sit down at tables and it was so uncomfortable and so unwelcoming of an experience that they just had to get up and move on. I know that those things exist and I know that it's really hard to deal with when it happens to you. I honestly, I get it. I truly do. But forcing yourself into a table and forcing yourself into a game isn't going to make the experience a good one. Find a table that is welcoming for you. Find one that makes you feel welcome. Find one that is and feels inclusive. I know there are a lot of really great people doing a lot of really great work as far as making sure their table is diverse and making sure that their tables are inclusive to everyone around it. And some of the experiences that we should be celebrating, it could be something as easy as I went into this gaming shop and they were super helpful and I found a new group to play with and they all seem really great and I can't wait to sit down and play with them. That is something that should be broadcast and shouted for the mountaintops and should be celebrated. Those are the kinds of stories that should be making the rounds as well as the struggles that we know people face. Celebrating positives and continuing to fight against the negative experiences that we have is the thing that I believe is going to propel the game forward. And I think that as we continue to grow and evolve the game, I think that people around the table are going to see less and less of the gatekeeping and more and more of the inclusive side, which we know is incredibly important. So in the campaign that I'm running right now, we're basing it off of the Uncaged Anthologies, which, by the way, you can get on the DMs Guild, and I suggest that you do. The books are beautiful. The adventures are very well written. It's a collection of mythos from all around the world. And it's all one-shots or one-offs, whichever way you prefer to say it. Um, but what I found interesting about the subject matter in these books is that it takes the monsters in these stories and makes you question whether or not they are truly the villains. What I found interesting, too, is that as I got further and further into the stories trying to pick out the adventures that I was going to use in my campaign, the majority of the monsters are actually female. And the majority of the endings of these stories led you to understand that these women who 
were either turned into these monsters or cursed or whatever the case is, you really do become a little bit more sympathetic. And I think that that adds a really interesting layer and texture to D&D when you see a villain who is themselves a victim. I think that, you know, there is a place for a bad villain. And I love villains who are bad simply for the sake of being bad. But finding a villain who has completely lost their way because of, of a way that they were treated unfairly um, is, you know, fascinating. And you should really look into those books. It's really, really great. Also, I want to note with the Uncaged Anthologies, a lot of the adventures will have a content warning across the top, and it'll be stuff like um, rape um, or sexual harassment, um, or you'll see infant side or deals with death of spouse or death of parents. Um, a lot of those content warnings are right across it. Check with your table. That's why those are there. Check with your table to see if any of those things would be bothersome to your players around the table. If they would be, just don't play that one. You don't have to have a big discussion or get all hurt or upset about it. You can just let it go and and pick a different adventure. Trust me, they're on their fourth book. There are a lot to choose from. What I adore most about the game is the ability to take really anything and turn it into something. If you can face off against and any number and combination of bad guys, you can rescue a town or you can roll badly and burn down the town and the forest around it. Not that my character Darjan ever found herself in that sort of situation. I mean, maybe there was this one time. It was an accident, though. And I mean, she did save the family that was under attack, which was the goal. So she did a good job, right? <laughs> What's fascinating about the game is that when you have your group of friends around the table, uh, you become your barbarian, you become your warlock. And when you talk about the game, it's not remember the time when your character did. It's remember the time we stormed the castle and saved the village. It's all stuff like that. In a time when it's so easy for us to be distracted by technology, having a group of friends come together a few times a month and sit down to have drinks, some good food, and a laugh and tell wonderful stories is, I think now, more important than ever. Perhaps that has as much to do with the game's resurgent, uh, resurgence as the streaming games that we get to watch. There seems to be a lot more, too, in the 5th edition put onto the role-playing um, aspect of the game, too, which I think could be what the draw is for a lot of uh, female first-time players who are 30 and over. I think a lot of people like myself who are coming back to the game as well are being drawn back, both by a little bit of nostalgia and uh, a little bit of um, intrigue into the developments of the game. At first, as well, I think the prospect of playing a game for four hours or longer could seem like a little bit much in today's society where things seem to be so fast. I know as a DM coming up with content to fill four hours or longer can feel daunting and heavy, but if your table is anything like mine, it has a wide variety of people from a number of different backgrounds who are all working together to tell a story. The character and their experiences somehow transforms complete strangers into fast friends, and it happens very quickly, which let's face it, as grown people can be difficult to do to find and make new friends. Being a D&D player also affords you a community pretty much anywhere you go. You just need to find your local gaming shop to find a new group to start to play with. And remember, this is huge. Not every table is going to fit every player, and not every player is going to fit every table. DMs are as different as players are. Some tables and game styles are going to work, fit and work for you and others are not. And that doesn't mean that the way that the DM is playing is wrong. It doesn't mean that the expectation of that player is wrong or less than either. To be fair, though, I have heard some horror stories of some DMs and I've heard some horror stories about players, too, who are uncooperative. Just hard to have at a table. Next on the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network, I want to talk about what I have found with the challenges and advantages of both homebrewed content and pre-written adventures. I think both have advantages, both have disadvantages. We'll talk about them next. 
Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast. I'm your host, Melinda Barkhouse. Now, before the break, we were talking about women finding their way to a welcoming table and how hard that can be and even how intimidating that can be. Uh, sometimes the beauty in finding the answer is coming to the conclusion that, honey, I'm just going to go ahead and start my own game and fill my own table with the people that I want to play with. There's nothing wrong with that. I encourage you to do that. But I want to get into the pros and cons of pre-written content and homebrewing a game yourself. So pre-written content includes all of the books that you can buy at your local game shop like Curse of Strad or Princes of the Apocalypse, the official content released by Wizards of the Coast, even the pre-written homebrew one-shots that you can find on DM's Guild. Sometimes simply being able to read the next adventure before you sit down to play is going to take a lot of pressure off of your shoulders as a DM. There are, however, DMs who find this to be constrictive and hard to follow or hard to really give that feeling of the sandbox um, opportunities in a game. And it starts to feel a little bit too railroaded. As a new DM, I understand that. Uh, pre-written adventure is a really great thing. It has all of your encounters. They're all there. They're all balanced. Your story is laid out for you. Your plot points are laid out for you. And you really can just sit down with your book and recite it verbatim. And no one is going to tell you that that's not fun. Your players are going to have a blast. It's a great way for you to gain confidence as a new DM. And it's a great way to get to know your players as well. The challenge, though, that I would give you, my fellow new DM, is this. Find one instance in your pre-written book where you can go off book. Yeah. And then have it come back to the book. It could be something simple like a different NPC that they have to talk to when they arrive in the town. Or maybe if you're really ambitious, an encounter that isn't written in the book. I know that feels intimidating, but I think once you start to experience how free a little bit of homebrewing feels and the little pieces that it can offer you, it's going to be really interesting to see how you can make a pre-written adventure with some homebrew elements really um, come together in one piece at your table. Now, I am going to confess that I do not feel ready enough to go full-on homebrew yet. I'm getting the hang of creating balanced encounters, just starting that, and I'm still finding ways to hit the right beats of the stories to make sure that my plots are done and making sure that everything is hit in the right order. And I'm also learning to not start on the next plot point until the first one is kind of concluded. That's that's a struggle because I get so excited. I want everything to happen all at once. Now, what I'm doing in the campaign that I'm currently playing is is I've committed to playing some one-shots from the Uncaged anthologies, but I'm connecting them all with an overarching story. I have a group called the Knights Defiance who recruits people who show exceptional skills. They have everything they could possibly want all tucked away in this little pocket dimension. Now, I used a pocket dimension because when the characters get sent off on their adventures, the pocket dimension can portal them um, to the next town or the next village or the next, you know, house where they need to be. Um, I have had them portal into like outhouses and uncomfortable situations to add a little bit of comedy to uh, their arrivals. And, um, I just think that it helps loosen everybody up as we start to uh, get into that week's game. What is also great about a place like headquarters is that I have it all in my head. I have the common area. I know what the kitchens look like. I know what the library looks like. Uh, my players had a chance to describe their sleeping quarters, so we know what all of those look like. Um, I know all of the NPCs that are there 
Some of them I haven't designed yet, but I know that they're there and I know what their roles are. Um, my characters haven't interacted with them yet, so I haven't fully fleshed them out. Um, and I think that having that all in your brain just gives a little bit of a better flow to your adventures, in my opinion. I, it could be a wrong one, but I, that's just what I have felt at my table. Some of my NPCs that I have at the headquarters are very good, neutral good, uh, chaotic good. Some of them are very neutral and others, my characters should not be believing at all. But that's as far as I'm going to talk about that because just in case they're listening, I don't want them to get any spoiler alerts. That was probably more of a spoiler than I even intended it to be, to be honest. What I have started to notice as well is the difference in my gameplay with the content that I have written. I can read an adventure a dozen times before I sit down to a session and not know it as well as the homebrew game that I have ready to go in my brain. The difference in my confidence, I think, is also very noticeable. Even the approach, the difference in the approach that I take is noticeable. One thing that you can do as a DM with pre-written stuff is rewrite some of the important parts and put them into your own words, even summarize key events and use your own setups. Maybe you sit down and you write out your description for the king's throne room and what the king looks like as you, um, you know, start to try to take it and make it a little more real in your head instead of just reading it verbatim to how the book describes it. Change the appearance of one of the NPCs. Do a gender swap. Um, you can take ownership of a little bit more. You're going to have it in your head and it's going to feel a little bit more flexible and relaxed when you sit down to play at the table. Homebrew does create its own challenges. I'm not going to lie to you about that. As a new DM, I'm just starting to write my own encounters. Um, although I think that saying I write them is actually being a bit generous. I do use D&D Beyond. I have an account there. They have an encounter builder. I've been working with that. It really does take a lot of guesswork out of it. It's pretty great. You can pick the number of opponents that you want. You input your party size and what character levels they are, what kind of terrain you're playing in, and it will give you some suggestions for your encounters. One that I did recently that I really enjoyed running had a minotaur skeleton, a skeleton, and a zombie. It was challenging for the players and it was really fun for me to run as a DM. I really don't think that that's the last that my players have seen of the Minotaur skeletons. I think that they're fantastic. Um, but I mean, maybe that's the key to why homebrew feels a little bit less um, restrictive. Things can go horribly wrong, but it feels flexible enough that you can save it and turn it around and you're, you're going to have all of the answers anyway. So it doesn't matter what the players do or how they affect the world. The pressure is off and it just feels like there may be a little bit more flow to it. The pre-written stuff still does give you all of the opportunities for role playing and, and things like that. And without the books as a starting point for DMs, honestly, where would we be, right? It's also possible that my lack of experience is what makes the books feel so constricting. Maybe um, uh, my approach to some of the pre-written material isn't hasn't been correct. I know that the stories are great and I'm not trying to tell you that it's boring to run one of those campaigns because again, it's really not. They really are fantastic. But um, for me um, at this point, it's left me feeling a little um, unsatisfied. And uh, when I'm going back at the end to make my session notes at the end of the game, I always feel like there were moments that could have been a little bit stronger. And again, that could be purely me as a new DM versus an issue with having pre-written, um, you know, games in your, at your table. Coming up after the break on the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast, what is a session zero? We're going to talk about some of the tools that I've used to help my players find background connections. So our group is a little more interesting than you all meet in a tavern. <laughs> we'll get into that next. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration, 
We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast on the GSMC Network. I'm your host, Melinda Barkhouse-Ross. And we were just getting ready to talk about Session Zero and what I think should happen during them to set up your campaign and table for success. Okay, Session Zero, what is it? Well, it's simply the day where everybody gets together for character creation. It could even be called your character creation session. Sometimes it's the first opportunity for everybody around your table to sit down and meet each other. And it's absolutely important at this point for you to establish table rules and set up things like how often you'll be playing, where you'll be playing, all of that kind of stuff like that. It's also important to find out what your player expectations are around your table. If you can find common ground between players who love role playing versus players who love combat, finding the right balance there is important. It's also a chance for you to borrow from previous DMs that people around your table have had experiences with. What were some of the rules that they liked at those tables? What were some of the things that didn't work so well at those tables? Don't allow it to become an opportunity for them to bash a former DM. Um, That's not constructive. And frankly, it's not all that interesting either. But finding the things that they would like to carry forward with them as they start a new campaign with a new DM, that could be very useful. There are a lot of different ways that you can roll your characters. There's the standard spread. There's the point by system. But the one that I use at my table because I love rolling dice is the whole roll 4d6 drop the lowest. I even roll for all of my NPC stats. Now, at my table, I also allow a re-roll for any stat that is rolled at a 6 or under if the player wants to. I mean, even if you're playing a wizard whose dump stat is more likely to be strength, a six seems like it's getting close to not being able to hold your, hold up your own body weight, right? Now, I have spoken to lots of DMs who completely disagree and think that that makes for some interesting character stuff, but I like to have that option available for my players. Session zero is also good to get some input from your players about the things that they don't want to see in games, like we were talking about with the Uncaged Anthology uh, anthology books, the uh, content warning. Domestic violence, for example, could be alluded to but doesn't need to be described in graphic detail as if it was a cutscene in a video game. But even if alluding to something like domestic violence Uh, is going to make a player uncomfortable, then scrap it. If it's a necessary piece of storytelling, then maybe skip that section of the story. Just a thought. You don't want players uncomfortable around your table. Um, The players are going to gather around your table week after week. I think the least that you can do is run a game that they feel good about playing and make sure that they feel respected while they're sitting at your table. I think another good thing to talk about during your session zero is how to have a player leave a game in case they can't continue on with your group or if they have to be away for a few weeks. I mean, life happens and as long as there is something set for players to be proactive about leaving the game um, or being away for an extended period of time, I think it's going to be easier um, for everybody involved, even if having just more open dialogue about it is what's going to make it easier. Um, also, I think starting a Discord or a Facebook group for your games is another great way to communicate and offer feedback between players and DMs and stuff. I think it's a great way to organize who's bringing what snacks, who's picking up the wine on the way over. And actually, that in itself is a good thing to discuss at your section zero. At your session zero, will food and alcohol be welcome at your table? Is there going to be a two drink maximum? What happens if a player drinks too much and needs a drive home? Will there always be one player at each game who is your D&D DD? your D&D designated driver. How will your group handle conflict between players at the table? Because it's probably going to happen, right? Um, Will the group take a 
break to address it on game night? Are you going to agree to give it 24 hours after the conclusion of the game and have the discussion after there's been a moment for everybody to cool down? You can't just let these things linger and fester. It's going to turn toxic. Session Zero offers you an opportunity, too, to play a quick one-shot to see how your players will be in a group. Maybe find a pre-written one-shot uh, with pre-generated characters that you could play just for fun. Maybe run the characters that you've just created through a quick level one encounter and have them all end up at the destination where the campaign will start, be it at the tavern or the guild hideout or whatever. Maybe it's just the job message board in the village where they're all going to meet up, anything like that. What if a player has a great idea that they think could be brought into the campaign? Are you open to that kind of input from players? Will you have a check-in with players before or after a game? I think that setting up these kinds of things during a session zero is really being proactive and helpful for everyone who's sitting down together. Now, bear in mind as well that not everyone can give voice to how they're feeling. Potential conflict can make people shy away from being open and honest about the things that are bothering them. So check in with individual players from time to time. That's such a good idea. The crucial thing here is that if a player feels like bringing something to your attention, don't get offended by it. Consider it and see if there is something that you can do to improve it. Or if you need to own up to a mistake, then you need to own up to a mistake and do that at the table with everyone there, including the player who brought it up. Um, a few, a group of people can be very complicated, but once you establish that you're open and respectful around your table, you're going to have a lot of fun together. Now, at my table, when we did our character creation for Session Zero, uh, we used the game Fiasco to roll for backstories for our characters. So we have some who were in blood bonds with like two different characters, and we have some who were, you know, neighbors. We have some who had worked together in previous um, campaigns or previous adventures and, and stuff like that. I think that if you want to really establish some cool stuff, I think rolling on tables like Fiasco are a pretty cool way to do it. And you can roll for relationships. You can roll for your weapons and magical items. You can roll for all of that stuff. There is a dungeon version of Fiasco. Uh, Will Wheaton talked about it. So if you Google Will Wheaton Fiasco, you're going to find the stuff. And the game, I believe, is even free, which is awesome. Now, a session zero for a veteran player can be a bit tedious, uh, but this is a great opportunity to let them shine a little bit and start to become the teachers for um, the time when you're around the table. I've watched it happen around my table where veteran players take new players under their wings and spend time going through things that will help during gameplay. I know one area that I need a lot more work in is encounters. There are parts of this that I never seem to be able to make stick in my brain, like how long a round of during an encounter should last. It never stays in my brain. I want to say six seconds, but I could be wrong. Other things that you should be watching for with new players is making sure they're adding all of their right weapon bonuses and, and things like that to their roles. When I started playing with Darjan, it took me a lot of combat before anything like that would start to stick. And the session zero is a good time to try to start to explain that. And it's a good time to, again, try to run at least one quick encounter with your group. Um, while you can't make something mandatory, you can strongly suggest that everybody be available for your session zero. How will you handle absent players? So what will their characters be doing in game? Will they continue to play or will it be assumed that your character is with the group but not participating um, or whatever? As a DM you need to come up with those guidelines. As a group of people sitting down at a table for the very first time, I think it's important for you to uh, all agree and make sure that things are set up the way that everybody is going to be happy with. So Coming up after the break on the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast, I want to talk about ripping off the Band-Aid and jumping behind the screen, and I'll give you some of my favorite resources for new TMs, or at least the ones that I have found to be very helpful. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. 
Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Melinda Barkhouse-Ross. And just before the break, we were going to start talking about why now is the right time for you to rip off the Band-Aid and give being a DM a shot. I mean, there are a lot of reasons, but one of the biggest is, and I think that after you're a DM for a minute, you're going to be a better player. Your respect for the role of DM and the amount of work that goes into the prep time before anybody is even sitting at the table is astounding. It will make you a better player. Trust me. You don't have to have a grand concept for a campaign. Run a few one shots with a couple of friends and see if you get comfortable. Find other dungeon masters and talk to them. Find your people on Twitter. Again, I've lucked into some great communities that have been very supportive and have been open and um, even willing to collaborate on a little bit of story writing or bouncing ideas off of each other. This is going to be a very valuable thing for you as you learn to develop your DM muscle. The ability to have a community of DMs for any ideas, even the ability to riff off of each other is huge. Um, you, it's going to make your content have more dimension and depth. They're going to give you lots of ideas. I'm part of a Discord where even NPCs are traded back and forth for different uh, DMs. And even things like, I need to create a character that the players are going to really like, but he needs to be you know, kind of conceited and kind of a jerk all at the same time helping another DM work through that kind of problem is uh, is really fun and it's going to inspire you a little bit as well. So what are some of the best resources for you as a new DM? Honestly, I can only really tell you about the ones that I have found that have been helpful. I'm sure that as you start to consume more content in the role of a DM, you're going to discover your own. One of the first YouTube channels that I started to follow specifically for D&D as a dungeon master is a channel called The Mighty Glue Stick. AJ Pickett has been putting out content for a minute, and he has broken down all of the player races and classes and backgrounds. He's gone on to the monsters. He's gone into D&D lore. He has one video in particular that I go back to. Uh, a lot is his video about tieflings. Hands down, one of the best explained videos for a player race that I have ever seen. It gave me a lot of insight when I was playing a tiefling wizard, and I think that his channel is one that you should subscribe to and you should watch it. Uh, the Dungeon Dudes are very helpful as well. One of the great things that they do is they give you things like the top five most underrated spells in D&D or the top five most powerful spells at level one and stuff like that. Um, they also talk about being a DM and how to run a game. They also are running their own campaign, which you can watch them play. And while you're watching them play, you're going to see them applying some of the things that they have been talking about in their videos. It's really cool and very clever how they do that. I like those guys a lot. Another one to watch is Matthew Coville. Um, he's another absolute favorite of mine. He will walk you through all kinds of stuff about being a DM. Uh, a lot of insight into different kinds of players and how to manage the personalities around the table. He talks about correcting course if something goes wrong. He's given players inside information and he has made that player kind of a co-DM with him as they start to tell a very twisted, very twisty, turny story. Major plot twists and stuff in that one and uh, really cool. I will say this about Matt Coville. You have to pay attention because that guy talks so fast, but the information that he gives you is so good. So subscribe and watch his channel and learn how to be a better DM with him. Really, the best advice 
that I can give you as far as who to go to for some inspiration or clarification as well um, is going to be D&D Beyond. Uh, they have some videos that are helpful in regards to gameplay and stuff like that. And I really can't stress finding a podcast or YouTube or even a Twitch stream um, that you can watch from a DM point of view, watch how the players are playing and watch how the DM is handling different stuff. I know with Critical Role, you can watch the players when they serve prize Matt Mercer with stuff and how he handles things. I'm not saying you have to be Matt Mercer. I have never said that, but one of the things I think that you can do is learn from Matt Mercer, the good and the bad. I think he's just, uh, he's, uh, he's a really fine example of what being a DM could be. Another place to look for inspiration um, is uh, by watching TV and reading books. Can you imagine reading a book these days? <laughs> But if you come across like an interesting spell, you can nip that and twist it and turn it into your own kind of thing and add it into your campaign. Uh, if you find a character that you love, like, for example, the Edgar Allan Poe character from um, Altered Carbon, very cool character. You can find a way to take that and integrate it into your campaign. Um you find an interesting person that you work with, you can turn them into an NPC. Maybe you, maybe you really liked gargoyles when you were growing up. Well, bring Goliath into your game as an NPC. If you liked the Smurfs, make Papa Smurf an all knowing, super wise gnome that your players can go on, you know, a pilgrimage to go and see. And he can have some kind of great answer to an impossible question. Uh, there are so many different places for you to get a little bit of inspiration. And sometimes it can just be an, in a, it can be, as simple as a sentence. Sometimes it could be as simple as uh, a name or a location, or maybe you see, um, which you don't see very often, but we do come across it. You're just kind of like, huh, you know, you see that one tree that's in the middle of a field and it's not surrounded by any other trees. Why? Maybe you can make that into a piece of your campaign. Who knows? But these are all things in a different way for you to start looking at the world to, to gather some of your inspiration. And oh my God, keep a notebook or notes on your uh, smartphone. I do that a lot. I will be doing something and I'll be like, oh, that would be cool. And then I, I drop a little note to myself or send it to my husband on Messenger. And I'm just like, ignore this. And then I just, you know, go off on a bit of a tangent about something completely bizarre and I'm sure that he's like, oh, okay, we're talking about D&D &D right now. Another thing that I want you to do is to be kind to yourself. You are doing so much better than you think you're doing in your first few games. And you are going to do great as you continue to learn because you care about the experience. You care about the story. You care about the amount of work that you put into it. You care about how you present it to the people who have signed on to sit around your story to help experience the story that you want to tell with them. All of these things you need to keep in mind because you're going to have sessions where you're like, woof, that was rough, but don't let it get the best of you. Make your notes at the end of the game in your DM notebook with your DM pen. See where you can improve for the next game. So dive in and you're going to want to brace yourself because nothing will ever be the same again. Thanks so much for being here with me. I'm Melinda Barkhouse Ross for the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast on the GSMC Network. We would really love it if you could drop us a five-star review, maybe drop a bit of positive feedback, or let me know what some of the things that you experienced as a new DM were and uh, how you've used that to continue to grow. It really would mean a great deal to us to uh, have any kind of feedback from you. We'd really appreciate it. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. 
Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.